afternoon. My name is Amanda, and I am one of the registered dietitians here at the Stony Brook World Trade Center Health and Wellness Program. Today, we are going to be doing our presentation on women's health. It's going to have a focus mostly on perimenopausal and menopausal women as the average age of our WTC cohort here at Stony Brook is about uh, between 55 and 60. Um, but of course, throughout this presentation, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to raise your hand in the chat or write a question in the chat. We will also have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, so let's go on. Our agenda for today's presentation is going to be about important nutrients specifically for women, our hormones and our health, ways of managing our weight as we get older, manage our stress, our sleep, and of course we focus on our muscle maintenance or growth over time, and we will touch a bit on supplementation, supplementation and herbs as well later on. So first, just to provide some background information, women uh, tend to have um, more, more different threats to their health. As you could see, this was taken from the CDC, National Institute of Health, uh, regarding the leading causes of death for females of all races across our country, with number one being heart disease, number two being cancer, and number three being chronic lower respiratory uh, illnesses. You've, if you wanna try to group these, majority of them tend to be chronic inflammatory conditions, which can be helpfully managed with diet and lifestyle. On the bottom here of this graphic, I placed a few contributing lifestyle factors that can help to impact us in terms of preventing these threats to our health, like doing our routine screenings, um, visiting our primary care annually, uh, following up with our mammograms, for example, and other protective screenings. Uh, stress management, especially um, as we get older, sleep, nutrition, physical activity, and controlling our daily environment. We will talk a bit in this presentation about endocrine disruptors and potential toxins that we might be taking in, in our day to day that can impact our overall health. I just want to make sure, can everybody hear me? Is everything clear? Um, if you can't hear me, please write in the chat or let me know, um, and I will move forward. So next, let's get to some important nutrients. I figured it would be great to highlight iron, calcium, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, as well as phytoestrogens, as these tend to be uh, often under uh, taken in in too low of amounts in women, or uh, we tend to be deficient in them. So iron, of course, females of reproductive ages or who are having their menses between the ages of about 19 and 50 years old should consume about 18 milligrams of iron per day as the recommended daily allowance. As menstruation decreases and we enter perimenopause, menopause, as, as the uterine lining is not shedding, the female is not losing that blood each month, iron needs decrease to about eight milligrams per day, similar to that of men. Uh, iron supplementation over the age of 50 tends to not be recommended for, for women as heavily, but also please make sure you talk with your doctor as there are different genetic traits that could impact our iron absorption and every person is unique or different. Some foods though, just to note that are high in iron um, and bioavailable iron, meaning that we're gonna actually absorb it and utilize it, would be of course like our fortified and our, our enriched breakfast cereals that would include like buckwheat and uh, steel cut or old fashioned oatmeal in the morning, uh, of course paired with some protein, right? Uh, oysters, our beans, our beef, think like our meat, our leafy greens, tofu, um, we will get to this, but soy is not the devil. Um, so of course, getting your beans and your protein in uh, from your animal meats or even going toward your enriched or fortified cereals are great options. Iron continued. So some signs of deficiency. So if someone's experiencing extreme fatigue, weakness, pale skin, chest pain, like a fast heart rate or shortened breath, um, the shortness of breath comes from iron being a major transporter in the body in terms of it helps to create 
red blood cells, which therefore help to transport nutrients like oxygen to our muscles and our brain. So if someone is deficient, they're not likely getting the oxygen that they need to those various tissues. Um, so that shortness of breath can also occur that way too, especially with regard to the lightheadedness, dizziness, headaches that people will tend to experience. Cold hands and feet as it does impact our circulation. Uh, inflammation in the tongue or soreness, brittle nails, unusual cravings for non-nutritive substances such as ice or, or dirt or starch can be a weird sign poor appetite. This is more so seen in infants. Uh, iron, of course,
Oh, I'm sorry. I think it just muted. I'm not certain where it uh, muted from, but uh, I'm just going to try to pick up where I think it muted it. But it's often it's important to get this checked routinely as uh, annually because it can fluctuate throughout the year. And often the doctor might not automatically go to test your vitamin D. So when you see your primary care physician, or if your cardiologist acts as your primary care physician or endo, just to ask them to add that vitamin D test onto your metabolic and lipid panel for the year. Omega-3s are another important one to go over in women and men too, as if we don't, is, if we don't take in omega-3s, especially from fatty fish in the form of EPA or DHA, we will be deficient. What that means is, yes, can we take in omega-3s from the ALA form, like chia seeds, walnuts, flax seeds, for example, plants? Yes. But to, for your brain to be able to convert that ALA form over to an EPA DHA form, you would have to eat pounds of walnuts or pounds of chia seeds, and that would also cause our calories to go way too high and would really hurt our stomachs. So um, if you're a fish eater, you are in luck. You want to aim to have at least two servings of fatty fish per week, but no more than three due to risk for mercury poisoning. Uh, fatty fish being salmon, tuna, oysters, sardines, anchovies, herring, just to name a few. Um, and of course, like lox or the little tuna packs as like a snack can be a t uh, an option, like the tuna albacore, I should say, can be an option as well. Uh, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, you might want to supplement with algae-based uh, omega-3s just to make sure you get that in your diet. Because if we do not get it in our diet, like I said, we are deficient. And we want to play around with what's called like our omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Omega-6s tend to come from our not so great fats like vegetable oils or grain fed or, or some people call it like feedlot meat versus eating grass fed meat. If you choose meat options that are free range or grass fed because that animal is leading a better life. They're eating the, they're grazing on the grass, eating the bugs, eating a diet natural to them. Or for example, wild cod or Norwegian farm raised fish that are swimming around the ocean, eating the krill. We are what that food eats, right? So the saturated fat content of that animal's fat tends to go down like eggs, for example, if it's a grass fed or free range chicken, the saturated fat goes down and the omega-3s go up. So that's what will account for that different taste sometimes in grass-fed meat compared to feedlot meat. But also when you look at the egg yolks, like this is a great time of year for it because chickens are laying more eggs. A lot more farms are selling fresh eggs now. Um, when you get like a pasture raised egg, it's going to have like a deep orange horizon color for the yolk. And that will tell you there's more vitamin A, more vitamin E, more omega-3s. It was a better raised chicken versus some of the classic like Eglin's Best, which I'm not knocking it. Eggs are really expensive right now. Something's better than nothing. But you'll notice it's more of like a dull yellow because it's more of that saturated fat and more depleted in vitamin A and vitamin E. Um, so that's just another way to increase your omega-3s. Uh, something, reason why I brought up the omega-6s though is for women, especially like I pulled up earlier, our leading causes of death tend to be chronic inflammatory conditions. So why not try to control our controllables, right? So typically Americans take in way more omega-6s compared to their omega-3s, unfortunately. I think it's about an eight to one ratio when we need to be taking them in like a one to one ratio. So that's why taking the fish oil can be very beneficial, not just for your triglycerides, but hopefully for reducing uh, risk for elevated inflammation in the body. Omega-3s have been shown to potentially increase our lifespan by about four to seven years. So that sounds pretty sweet to me. Um, but also with that being said, I, this seems a little sciencey over here on the left, but the way I want to explain it is when you're, we are what our the tissues that make up our body is based off the food we eat, right? The skin that makes my, my skin was made off of, out of the food I ate. So for example, your cell walls 
that make up all parts of your body is typically made up of fat. So if I'm taking in a lot of omega-3s, that type of fat is going to be more what's called DHA fat that helps to make up my cell wall. That's going to make my cell wall nice and loosey-goosey, right? Not as sticky, a little bit more fluid. But if I was to take in more omega-6s, like I'm eating a lot of processed crackers and Cheez-Its and, and processed snacks, I should just say, right? That has a lot of these soybean oils, corn oils, for example. Um, the walls of my cell are going to be more, more rigid, more firm, right? So in terms of what's called the plasticity of our blood vessels, right? You want to have nice, flexible, bendable blood vessels. You don't want to have firm atherosclerotic blood vessels that are going to be more prone for clotting and heart disease down the road. So that's why it's just an important point to make sure you, you put an emphasis on getting in more omega-3s in your diet, focus on the positive, and then focus on reducing the negative of the omega-6s. Again, of course, we're here, we're free uh, here at WTC to see members. So if you have any personal questions, you can always call us at 631-855-1200 to schedule a nutrition counseling appointment. Next is a, a highly contemptuous issue uh, that a lot of patients tend to feel a little nervous about is soy. So soy is not the devil. I know it sounds funny. So phytoestrogen, soy is, actually, is an endocrine disruptor. It can be a, a uh, estrogen mimetic and it can be good for women in different parts of their life. So if we're consuming a lot of soy and we're pregnant or lactating, it might not be the best for us, right? Especially large portions, or if we have breast cancer, right? We want to try to potentially limit our soy intake. But if we are perimenopausal or menopause, menopausal and our estrogen is starting to go down, you want to try to take in soy from healthful whole food sources, big emphasis on that. So eating soybeans, edamame, tofu, tempeh, soy milk, few times a week can maybe help to reduce hot flashes, for example. Different cultures like Australian cultures, the Australian culture and the Asian cultures like in Japan and China, they tend to eat a lot more soy than us. And then they also tend to have lower, um, lower hot flashes, for example, easier uh, menopause, for example, eases, easier sleep. Um, and it's often thought to be due to the one to two daily servings of soy in their food. So using soy milk is fine. You just wanna make sure that you're not having soy isolates. So there's certain companies, I don't wanna name brands and be mean, but like there's certain protein shake companies or meal replacement companies where it's, you only eat their bars and their, sna their snacks, which it's not the most sustainable thing anyway. That's mainly made out of processed soy or soy isolates. There's certain bars like Quest bars will be made up of a lot of just soy isolates. Notice that you don't see soy used as like a protein powder in that concentrated form. You tend to see more like pea protein as a vegan substitute, or you'll see like whey protein, for example, or casein. Um, soy in very concentrated genetically modified forms might not be the best for us. And I highly recommend staying away. But of course, at the end of the day, keep it simple. Stick with unprocessed forms. Like also bean sprouts can be another great option as well. So now we're gonna get more into the hormonal aspect of this presentation. So I figured let's first go down to basics and go through the, the menstrual cycle. So day one of the menstrual cycle is the start of menses or one's period. And when that, that's typically gonna be between one and three days or one and five days of the cycle uh, where the lining sheds. Then we enter what's called the follicular phase, which is days six through 14 um, until ovulation where estrogen is steadily rising, rising, rising. We're feeling good. We've got all this energy. Um, intermittent fasting is more possible during this phase for women, more so 14 hours, not so long, not like 24 hour fast, that'd be a little crazy for us. Um, but then once ovulation uh, starts to occur, that's around day 14. So the, the 
there's the endometrium begins to grow and thicken in addition to the follicle or the eggs uh, stimulating hormone causes the egg to grow during days 10 to 14 when we hit ovulation at day 14, where there's a sudden increase in the luteinizing hormone or LH hormone, and it causes that egg to release. After that egg releases and we're done with ovulation, it's what's called the luteinal phase. That's days 15 to 28, where the egg leaves the ovary and begins to travel through the fallopian tubes to the uterus. That's when we want to do a little bit less like HIIT training or less high intensity cardio or high inflammatory weightlifting, do that stuff the beginning of the cycle. But then the second half of the cycle, the other two weeks, progesterone starts to rise. And progesterone requires carbohydrates, like in the form of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and legumes, right? Those are our great carbs. Um, progesterone starts to rise, which utilizes carbohydrates. And that's why some of us can tend to get those sweet cravings a little bit more around that time to help prepare the uterine lining for pregnancy. Um, if there's no implantation from sperm, uh, the estrogen, the progress progesterone drop and cycle resumes again. Um, so during these phases, you do not want to do intermittent fasting in the second half of your cycle. When it comes to perimenopause and menopause, that is something that should be discussed on a more individual level, especially depending on what phase of perimenopause or menopause we are in. Uh, something that I like to promote is natural cycles, which is an application that you can track your cycle in. Um, it even links with the aura ring where it takes your temperature every morning for you without you even having to think about it. So you can see exactly where you're at in your cycle and correlate that with your workouts and your diet regimen. I'm only scratching the surface of this, to be honest with you guys. I can do a whole presentation on just rotating around your cycle in terms of your exercise and your diet. Maybe another time though. Um, so then we enter perimenopause, usually around age 47 is the early transition. Uh, cycles are still mostly regular, maybe some spotting, maybe some mixed months. But then the second stage is the late transition, which is amenorrhea or halting or ceasing of menstruation or one's period uh, that lasts at least about 60 days. Typical onset is about age 49. If you want to try to confirm with your doctor, whether you're in perimenopause or menopause, you can ask for your labs, uh, like a day three uh, FSH hormone testing or your estradiol testing. Uh, estradiol should be low once finally in menopause, aka our estrogen starts to drop, right? Which is natural part of life for all of us uh, around age 45. You want to check in with yourself. Your period is actually a vital sign. So men don't have this vital sign. So that's thanks for them. I'm kidding. But uh, it's something that tells you how your body is functioning and about the health of the individual. So you want to ask, like, has my period started to get shorter? Is it getting heavier? Is it absent? Um, is it varying in length in terms of the cycle? Is the cycle going 28 days? Is it going 25 to 35 days? It can be a range. And what you do, do during your month in terms of your stress levels, your diet, your sleep can all impact this. Um, again, working with a dietitian or your uh, doctor can, can help to give you more individualized feedback. And then of course, you want to bring up symptoms with your providers uh, regarding like your hot flashes, your sleep, your, if we're having any mood changes like mood swings, anxiety, depression, vaginal dryness or sexual dysfunction because that plays a large quality, large toll on your overall quality of life, um, especially with something that you have to deal with on the day to day that take away enjoyable, pleasurable things for your health. Next is menopause the M word, as some women like to say. So the average age of onset tends to be about 51. On average, about 50 million women in the United States are going through menopause at one time. So we are never alone. Uh, and of course, something to note with menopause, like we were saying on the left here are the symptoms of menopause. Uh, as women progress into menopause, their hormone production obviously declines. And it is therefore the role of the adrenal glands, uh, to, which are like little walnut sized uh, glands right by your kidneys 
uh, and they take over some of the roles of the quote unquote failing ovaries. I hate that term personally. During this life stage, the adrenal glands produce a hormone called androstenedione, which can convert to the most potent form of estrogen, oestrogen, uh, or oestrogen, uh, estrone via conversion that takes place in the fat tissues. So now you see the adrenal glands are taking over for the ovaries, right? So your adrenals also make cortisol. So I'm going to make this connection for you guys down the road. So via this conversion that takes place in the fat tissue, androstenedione is also converted into testosterone in turn. Testosterone can undergo a process um, known as aro aromas aromastation, sorry, to convert it to another form of oestrogen or oestradiol, uh, DHA, another hormone produced by the adrenal glands. And the DHA is typically at its highest when we are in our early 20s and decreases with age to the point where values of DHA are 20% lower than their original peak values um, by the time we reach age 70 or 80. So our adrenals begin to take over for our ovaries to help to make testosterone and estrogen and DHEA. So now we're really stressing out the adrenals because they weren't, didn't have to do this work earlier in our lives. So with that being said, since the source of precursor hormones for oestrogen and testosterone and progesterone are produced in the adrenal glands, it is crucial that optimal adrenal health is maintained during menopause and, and postmenopause. So if our adrenals aren't getting stressed out, and having to produce cortisone or adrenaline, and we're managing our stress, we can better support our adrenals in supporting our, our estrogen and our testosterone, our progesterone and DHA production, correct? So if chronic stress is present and the adrenal glands are required to produce large amounts of cortisol and DHEA, the glands may not be able to keep up with the demand of sex precursor, hormone precursors. As well as this, high cortisol production has been linked with bone loss in both men and women. Furthermore, increased cortisol production can increase core body temperature, therefore contributing to the development of hot flashes or high cortisol levels may increase the worsening of hot flashes. This is, occurs as a way of your body trying to cool down its, its main body temperature. So, which all impacts weight. When we have high cortisol levels, we are more prone for that storage of fatty deposits or visceral fat in the med midsection. So there's more reasons to manage our stress besides just mental health, right? So roles of estrogen. Estrogen is uh, a amazing hormone in that it helps to maintain our bone mass. It allows for cellular division. It helps protect against heart disease. Oh, whoever just entered, please make sure to mute. Thank you. Uh, helps to protect against heart disease and the storage and distribution of fat. So estrogen is what gives us nice you know, fat around our hips and our buttocks area and keeps it off of our midsection. So that's where the term, and I hate this term, but uh, a lot of people know it, is the menopause belly uh, starts to occur as the estrogen drops, which causes our fat to drop and be more so around the hips and buttocks. And instead we start storing it more in the abdomen. Because we're storing it more in the abdomen, we are at a greater risk for heart disease because if we increase our visceral fat or abdominal fat or waist circumference, uh, it puts more stress on those surrounding organs. So therefore increased risk for elevated glucose as well, or reduced uh, insulin sensitivity. So that's where, of course, during your monitoring visit, if you'd like to utilize our Tanita body composition scale or to schedule a nutrition counseling appointment, this guy behind me <laughs> is the Tanita body composition scale. And uh, it will tell you how much visceral fat you have on the body. And you can track it from year to year to see where it's changing, as well as your muscle, body fat percentage, BMI, basal metabolic rate, aka how many calories you burn at rest, uh, among a few others. So estrogen metabolism starts to drop when estrogen drops. So we're not burning as much calories to be alive. Uh, there tends to be weight gain, of course, as metabolism drops, that fat shift to the abdomen, increased risk for heart disease. This can occur um, during the perimenopausal transition, or, which is about three to 10 years before menopause. Something that also impacts our hormones, though, to consider, especially during this time, so that we can try to keep our estrogen elevated in more natural ways, is looking at endocrine disruptors in our diet and our lifestyle. 
So actually first, before I do this slide, I'm just gonna switch it because I think it's easier to comprehend this way. So endocrine disruptors, you look at the top left images, they look more complicated than they really are. You'll see the normal hormones that are the green squares on the first left square. Those green squares are just acting as a normal hormone, which goes and binds to the hormone receptor and then causes that cellular response, right? That's what we want. Sometimes there's things called hormone mimetics or hormone blockers, which can come from certain endocrine disruptors. As mind you, soy is an endocrine disruptor, but a positive one in certain phases of our life. So the hormone mimetics can bind to the cellular receptors and can cause a hyperestrogen response or a diluted response depending on the hormone receptor, um, but it's not fully acting like the hormone itself, which can cause problems, or it binds to the receptor completely and causes no response whatsoever and is playing defense, blocking the actual hormone from the receptor to do its job. So what we wanna pay attention to is what, what's called endocrine disruptors, which are these, these uh, pieces, of, these products right here, like BPA, which is a certain form of plastic in our water bottles, for example, dioxanes, which are produced as a byproduct from herbicides, uh, paper bleaching, for example. BPA is also in a lot of receipts. So if you're someone that works in retail as like a, a part-time or, or retirement gig or full-time or whatever, you've, and you're handling receipts a lot, you wanna make sure you're wearing gloves to ab avoid absorbing so much of it. Uh, if you just touch them from time to time, it's not that big of a deal. You're not absorbing that much. Um, PF cool. Oh, hello? Oh. Uh, PFAS or PUFAs, um, they're widely used. They came a lot of DuPont, to be honest with you. They tend to be in a lot of firefighting foams, but also in our nonstick pans. So you wanna look, uh, make sure when you're, you're updating your pans and your plastics to make sure that they don't come, contain PFAS because those are those eternal chemicals that can stay in the body. Ph uh, phytoestrogens, that's like soy. Those are our good hormone disruptors, our endocrine disruptors. Uh, but the list can go on and there's even more than this. So not to scare everybody, because I, I know it, it's it's a it's definitely an in-depth topic there. Uh, the list can go on. There's an app called Think Dirty by the Environmental Working Group. It used to be free. Now it's like $3.99 a month. Yucca is another one. I'm not quite certain who does Yucca, what regulatory body, if there, it is even a regulatory body or a private agency. However, uh, I like to recommend patients buy the, the Think Dirty app for one month, pay the $3.99, test all products, beauty products, cleaning products, et cetera, because you'll scan it. It gives it a grade from one to 10. Uh, and it's all color coded as well. And it also offers alternatives. It'll tell you the specific chemical that's also in that product as well. Uh, so I think it is a useful tool. Again, that's Think Dirty is the app. Um, Sorry. So next is endocrine disruptor solutions. So eating a varied diet can be helpful, right? Avoid heating plastics for the love of God in the microwave, uh, or especially takeout, right? Like we often want to say avoid takeout because they add a lot of salt, sugar, butter, processed ingredients, but also think about it. That hot food is going into that plastic biodegradable container that absorb, that causes your food to absorb that plastic. It's sitting in there for God knows how long from when the Uber driver picks up the food if it's delivery and takes it home or how long it takes you to bring it home or, or whatnot. And then we're eating those plastics. Um, I've heard a figure that, um, guys, just please uh, keep yourself muted. Um, unless you have questions, it's not a problem. Uh, I've heard a figure that we absorb about a credit card's worth of plastic per year. So trying to marinate your meats in glass containers or store your meal preps in glass containers, gradually switching over. I'm not saying reinvest in every new thing in your kitchen, but as, as things go to the wayside, replace them with cleaner options. Uh, cook with cast iron or stainless steel, especially if we have anemia, can help you to absorb some extra iron. Uh, wash your hands routinely, not just for risk of pathogens, but also for these endocrine disruptors. Uh, turn up your nose at fragrances, 
yes, we inhale them and they're not the greatest for us, or just double check them and think dirty. Uh, replace plastic with glass containers, as I've said, fresh before canned whenever possible, or even I like to say the flash frozen produce is also great too. Um, keep your windows open, uh, allow free airflow throughout your house, get outside and walk. Um, carpets can tend to contain a lot of dirt and pathogens and these endocrine disruptors. Um, so either really cleaning carpets or switching to more hard floors. Again, that's it depends on how extreme you wanna take this. Uh, I just like to provide the information. So next is more so the weight management uh, in terms of helping to control the effects of menopause on weight. So as we explained, it's uh, that people like to call it like an unexplained weight gain, but really it's because of that endocrine drop, but that causes that abdominal fat deposit. There is a difference though, however, between subcutaneous abdominal fat and visceral fat. Both are negative, but visceral fat is the more important one to target. As you could see in this image, the subcutaneous fat is the fat that you can tend to see just below the skin surface, this, the cutaneous skin barrier, right? Or the visceral fat, which is here in the midsection all around the organs. So you can see how that visceral fat does put a lot of stress on your body's tissues. So it increases risk for cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, premature death, cancer, et cetera, chronic diseases, right? So decri declining metabolism, like people say, oh, your metabolism drops is just because you get older, is kind of a cop-out. What really is going on is we lose about 10% of our muscle every 10 years. So when women say, I don't weight train because I don't want to get bulky, it makes my head spin because we don't have enough testosterone to actually get bulky. And if we're focusing on getting enough muscle throughout our life and weight training two, three days a week in responsible ways, not deadlifting or one rep max and working with professionals to work around our mobility um, barriers, it can help us to actually preserve this muscle, which has a lot of mitochondria in it. Why do we care about mitochondria? It's the powerhouse of the cell. So it helps to drive our metabolism. The more mitochondria or the more muscle tissue you have, the more calories you burn just to be alive. Uh, it also helps to create, to facilitate more insulin sensitivity, right? So it acts almost like a sponge to absorb the sugar and burn it up, right? Which is amazing. Um, however, when we do reduce our muscle mass, what tends to happen is we wanna try to eat the same amount of calories as we were eating when we had that higher muscle mass and we had a higher basal metabolic rate or calorie needs. So what happens? We tend to develop more fat tissue. So someone could be the same weight, but you know, increase fat mass and decrease muscle mass, for example, then they're burning less to be alive, their metabolism drops. So weight training is a great solution for that unexplained, but really it's explained weight gain. Um, controlling our controllables, right? Next is a weight management plan for the body's metabolic slowdown, right? So often in our lives as we get older, all of us women are gonna be subjected to this, myself included. Um, what happens as we get older? We have less time for exercise, more time to have to give towards family and work responsibilities. So setting boundaries for oneself to prioritize oneself to the best of our abilities, uh, making sure that we try to follow a balanced Mediterranean diet as, you know, I like to follow the science and, and the evidence and the peer reviewed journals, which all point towards a Mediterranean diet, which is not necessarily saying eating exactly Mediterranean foods, the Asian diets, the African diets, they're all very similar. It tends to be an emphasis on what? Fruits and vegetables, protein throughout the day, eating throughout the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, right? Our biggest meal being in the middle of the day when we're most active and running around, uh, lighter fare in the evening, right before we go to sleep, uh, sticking with lean proteins. Our little ism is if it swims, flies, or grows from the ground, we're in the clear, right? Remember that tofu, that tempeh, those edamame, those soybeans, great source of fiber. It's not, I mean fiber, excuse me, great source of protein. It's not a complete source as it's missing methionine, but if you add it into a diet where you're having turkey, chicken, fish, it can be a great component to help manage those hot flashes like we were talking about and hopefully get a more sound night's sleep too. 
protein also helps to make us feel full. I'm going to get on my protein soapbox. Protein makes helps to make us feel full. So if we're not getting enough protein and, and we're wondering like, why am I eating so much at night? One, it's also um, can be emotions and that's a whole other piece to discuss, but also you want to try to control the physiological effects of food as well. So if we're not getting enough protein, which is the most satiating nutrient, close to fat too, and same with fiber, those three nutrients tend to make us feel full. That's why we want to have a balanced diet. That's what a balanced diet means in part, right? Balance is, is protein, fat, and fiber every meal, right? So that binds together in a bolus in our stomach, makes us feel full, mitigates our blood sugar spikes, because now that bread or that pasta has other things to bind with, or better yet, those beans, those vegetables, those fruits, those good carbs, binds with the protein and maybe the olive oil in our meal. And now it's moving much more slowly from our stomach to our small intestine. And that sugar is steadily rising versus if I just ate you know, a bowl of pasta or a bagel in the morning uh, with limited uh, eggs or something on it, it's just gonna move quickly through my stomach, dump that sugar into my small intestine where it's gonna get absorbed and give me a big crash up and then back down. And then I'm gonna be craving that high again later. Uh, green tea can also be a great detoxifying agent. Uh, choosing complex starches, like I mentioned, the beans and legumes, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, starchy vegetables included like squash, peas, potatoes with the skin on it. They all have fiber to help keep your digestion regular. We should try to be having at least one to two bowel movements per day to help get rid of that extra estrogen that's breaking down in our body. Uh, we don't wanna keep that in our body at all. Um, pre and probiotics to help manage if we're getting any IBS related symptoms, uh, as there's changes in our microbiome that goes on as we get older as well. Some of my favorite brands are Align, Culturel, and Megaspore. But again, it, it's so individualized. There's a million different strains of these probiotics and different strains do different things. So it really depends on the purpose to which someone is taking it. Like there is uh, cyanoprobiotics, which are meant for merely brain health because your gut and your brain talk to each other. So that's just an example. Uh, ground flax seeds, like we were talking about, research shows four to seven tablespoons uh, within 12 weeks, decreased night sweats and, and uh, helped with weight loss. My thoughts on why it helped with weight loss is it's a dietary fat, helps you to feel full. So if you're filling up on more like fiber and fat and protein, we're going to be going less towards those refined carbs like sugars. Um, ground flax seeds. Notice I keep saying ground. We don't want to have any whole flax seeds. Our intestines are not quite strong enough to crack them and absorb those fats coming into the body. So ground is great. If you can freshly grind them, even better, store it in the fridge uh, because it's a fat and it oxidizes and you want to get the most out of your food. Um, you could add it to oatmeal, a tablespoon, but notice if you're adding a tablespoon of, of fat to your oatmeal, depending on your needs, but for most women, we don't need to go adding a tablespoon of peanut butter or another tablespoon of walnuts, for example. So keeping portioning and calorie balance in mind too with this, because I see that happen a lot where someone adds flax seeds and it's like, why did I gain weight? Because it's a fat and we got to watch our calories still with it. Um, we can add it into protein pancakes. We could add it into oatmeal muffins. We could add it into our parfaits with Greek yogurt or cottage cheese, just as some examples to include it in our diet. Like we said, the soy isoflavones or just adding some tempeh, tofu, uh, edamame, I love to snack on. It's a great volume food at night. So if you're really craving a snack in the evening after dinner, excuse me, um, you can do like the steam fresh edamame, take it out of the plastic bag, of course, and, and nuke it in a microwave safe glass container. And you could dip it with like some low sodium soy sauce or coconut aminos. And it's great because the edamames are a protein and a vegetable. It tends to be a good volume food, similar to popcorn. So if you're eating a movie, eating while watching a movie or something, um, it's, a, it's a better option to have. It's also just a good snack. Mind your meal timing. So if you're eating breakfast and then like going all day, like a typical stressed out New Yorker and not having lunch and then coming home and wondering, oh my God, why am I eating all these snacks or why am I so ravenous? Like we do want to try to eat every three, four hours to maintain balanced blood sugar levels, which will impact our hormones and, and also therefore our appetite and better control our food intake. Um, 
we want to cut back where we can on portions if we if that's our personal personal barrier again seeing a dietitian for more individualized feedback on you know what's going on in your day to day and how we can make some healthy adjustments is always advisable doesn't hurt right and it's free uh, beware of health saboteurs so like processed foods right so in our country we tend to be overweight and undernourished so what I mean by that is people take in too many calories from foods that do not have enough nutrients in it, right? So they could be high in sugar, but not a lot of protein, vitamins, minerals, healthy fat, any of the things that we we're talking about today. So that's where we could be overnourished in terms of calories, but undernourished in terms of the quality of the calorie is not very, what you call nutrient dense, right? Um, also like, yeah, like how Katie was, is just saying in the chat too, you can check out our unprocessed versus processed food presentation. Just kicked me out of the presentation, sorry. Our processed versus unprocessed foods presentation to really go more in depth in understanding how to change things up in the diet and get more whole foods in. Red meat, I kind of want to change how I wrote that on this presentation. Red meat's not the devil, all right? So if we're at risk for colon cancer, we've got a lot of colon polyps, family history of, of colon cancer, we want to watch it, right? But it's, again, it, it's all about the quality of the food that we're eating. So if you're getting feedlot red meat or processed red meats like hot dogs, I don't care if they're vegan, I don't, burgers, I don't, I don't care if they're vegan either, that like if they're beyond or impossible burgers, like it's about the quality. If it's vegan or vegetarian and it's a black bean burger and it's homemade, right? It's a whole food, it's not a processed option, that's so much better, right? So staying away from the processed meats, the processed sausages, the brujut, as much, even though I'm Sicilian, I love it, right? Brujut, the uh, salami, the hot dogs, the feedlot beef, right? Or ground beef. That's what can be more problematic if we consume greater than two servings per week, uh, especially when it gets like really charred on the barbecue, that black and mallard reaction. It, that increases our risk for colon cancer, but also pancreatic cancer as well. So that's why we want to watch the red meat. But if you're getting it in the form of grass-fed meat and you're choosing like a sirloin or a homemade grass-fed patty where you're taking the chopped meat and maybe mashing up some beans and sneaking that into the burger or doing a homemade black bean burger or buying the brand Applegate, which is what's called, it's nitrate and nitrite free. So is boar's head, believe it or not too. Uh, those are much better options. Then next of course is refined sugars, which everyone knows to stay away from and triggers for emotional eating or feeling-based eating. We have a whole presentation on emotional eating and feeling-based eating. Uh, so please check that out on our WTC Nutrition website where you could see a whole slew of videos for um, all different topics recorded. And then let's see, this brings us to effects of chronic stress. So this, I don't wanna take so much time going in depth with it, but it's just to drive home the point that it does have a physiological effect on your body and your brain um, and your overall health and that stress management should be considered in terms of those trying to manage their heart health, their respiratory health, in general muscular health. Like we were saying earlier, your adrenals have to work a little harder, especially in perimenopause and menopause uh, stages of life, right? So because those adrenals are working harder, especially for going through a stress response, you wanna try to support them with increased mineral intake, uh, depending on your unique needs, right? Uh, if we have hypertension or different things going on, we wanna be careful. But using an unrefined salt, like a Celtic salt, a sea salt, uh, with or a cup of bone broth, a nettle infusion, or mineral or electrolyte mocktails, uh, the trace mineral drops that you can get on Amazon are great to add to your water uh, is a great way to get more minerals in your body to support those adrenals to give them more of the fuel that they need to make those hormones. Um, we want to avoid fasting overall if we can eat breakfast, lunch and dinner uh, most days that would be amazing. Uh, we want to include carbs at every meal but by carbs we mean fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans and legumes and in, in proper proportion and balance with other nutrients. 
we want to include a paired snack of carbs with fat or healthy fat or protein right throughout the day. Sometimes if you find that you're getting home from work and you're really, really hungry, give yourself a need to help control what we call like the effort mindset, like effort, I'm so hungry, I need to eat something now. And we end up grazing or, you know, picking while we're, we're cooking dinner. So giving yourself a paired snack when you get home could be a great option. Um, we want to avoid going longer than four to five hours without eating. We want to try to add cruciferous vegetables into our diet. Uh, the cruciferous vegetables have a sulfur, it's called sulforaphane actually, uh, component. And of course, like mustard seed has myrosinase in it, which both help to convert the sulfate DHEA to DHEAS, so the better form of DHA, EA, which is that hormone we were talking about that is our highest in our 20s and starts to decrease by about 20% by the time we're in our 70s or 80s. Um, that's helpful for us maintaining a good hormone balance. And of course, the bottom line, most important thing to emphasize when talking about adrenal support is prioritizing stress reduction and perceived stress signals to the body. So that doesn't necessarily mean um, emotional stress, could just be stress in terms of taking on 50 million things in our day, right? As women tend to do. So it's just doing a self check-in. Am I, am I, you know, do I like my commute? I'm, I'm stuck in traffic. Is it my living situation? Is this the, the healthiest place for me to be? What about my work situation? Um, what's going on at home? Do I need to speak with a mental health therapist? Um, or talk with somebody about better tips and tricks for managing healthy boundary setting to be able to manage our stress better and then therefore help our overall quality of life and make time for ourselves, right? Um, stress management can be done in, in so many different ways. Uh, meditation is, a, is an all-time favorite of many. Of course, exercise is a great stress manager. And exercising in a way that feels good for us. It could just be walking, jogging, weight training please, for the love of God, I'm no, kidding. Um, you guys could tell I'm a big promoter of weight training. Uh, reach out, reaching out for support, like calling a friend or a loved one, setting goals, hobbies, skills, life challenges for ourselves so that we keep growing as individuals. We never stop, right? Um, to find joy and meaning and new things in life that just make us happy. Uh, these are a whole, on the left, there's a whole slew of other things that we have a whole tip sheet on our website, which has a ton of education materials available. One is called Stress Relieving Interventions, uh, which has more in-depth information on what these deep breathing exercises, progressive relaxation is per se. Of course, there's always a slew online. And I do always want to plug, there's a couple of really great meditation apps out there called Calm is one, Headspace is another, and 10% Happier is another. Of course, Aura, which is a ring I mentioned earlier, has a whole slew of meditations to do for sleep, relaxation, etc. And meditation has been shown to be helpful for our heart health and our uh, reducing our blood pressure, just as a fun fact. Sleep, I'm not going as in depth as Katie did an awesome presentation. She's one of our other, uh, she is our other dietitian here at WTC. Uh, it's just us two. And she did an amazing one on sleep. So I don't want to go too in depth as you have access to about a 30, I think it's 30 to 60 minutes long, just on ways to optimize sleep. But something just to drive home is that there's many reasons why, why sleep is so important. Uh, as you can see, it lowers our risk for Alzheimer's disease, dementia, uh, risk for diabetes, um, prediabetes, heart, heart disease, like we said, uh, stress, anxiety, improves our mood. But also when you're sleeping enough, your appetite tends to be a little bit more regulated because our hypothalamus, sometimes the lines get a little crossed as our hypothalamus does a whole slew of things. But one of those things that it does is it tells us that we're thirsty or we're hungry or we're tired. And when we're fatigued, sometimes we get a little confused whether we need to go for food or should I just go take a nap? Uh, on average, we can take in about 270 more calories than we need when we are sleep deprived, typically from fat and uh, carbohydrates, not often the best sources of fat and carbohydrates as well. So this is part why it is important for weight balance. Uh, 
during sleep, our bodies produce important hormones like leptin and ghrelin. Think ghrelin, ghrelin, like a hunger hormone tells you you're hungry. Leptin tells you you're satiated. Uh, it, it regulates our appetite. And uh, sleep also helps to reduce inflammation in the body and promote cell growth and regeneration. So in terms of our muscle mass and those who are weightlifting, even if we're just trying to maintain, sleep is, is really important for getting that recovery that we need in between workouts. Because if we're not recovering and we're just exercising, 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 not eating enough protein, not sleeping enough, burning the candle at both ends, then it's likely that your body's going to be more prone to go into what's called protein catabolism. And it sounds like cannibalism for a reason, because it's literally your body eating at your muscle stores. So um, one of the many reasons why sleep is so, so important. Getting um, an adequate amount of sleep has been linked to longer and healthier lives, free of chronic illnesses, such as heart disease, diabetes, two great uh, chronic diseases that impact women greatly. It's, it's unfortunate. And finally, sleep is important because it helps us maintain our mental health. Getting enough sleep can help reduce stress and anxiety, like we were saying earlier, especially from those who do suffer from PTSD and depression. So I'm not going to go in depth with this. We've already talked about it, but also note something to elevate the conversation is that sleep helps with detox, right? So we're trying to get rid of the hormones that have been breaking down our body. We don't want that storing in our, our adipose tissue um, and getting rid of maybe potential toxins that we've taken in throughout our day. Uh, sleep, uh, yeah, like Katie had written, um, boogers in the eyes, of course, our sweat, the dry mouth, that film that we get around our mouth, that's ways of our body excreting. Uh, I sand is the extra minerals that our body doesn't need, for example. And if we are, I don't know why it doesn't want to progress. Hmm. It's, oh, there we go. Now it's progressing. So if we're shift workers, these are all tips that we can add to our day. So build time into your schedule to try to take naps as much as possible. Uh, if you are sleep deprived, uh, keep Sched try to schedule your sleep and prioritize it, right? Set the bedtime switch on your phone so it can give you an alert when to go to bed based on what time you're setting your alarm for. If you're on permanent nights, try to keep regularity in your sleep patterns even on the days off. So trying to like date, like I, say for example, I wake up at six for work most days. I'm gonna try to wake up at six on Saturdays and Sundays as well to try to keep my rhythm in, in sync with each other. Also, that means going to bed around the same time on Saturdays and Sundays too, or Fridays. Uh, when working nights, try to keep your sleep so you wake up close to the start of the next shift rather than going to sleep as soon as you get home in the morning. Or alternatively, split your sleep for a few hours when you get home in the morning and then take an extended nap that ends just before you are to go back to work the next night so you're more recharged. Your sleep environment is so important. We can wear those little jelly eye masks too that also help our skin, but that can also help to cool us down. Sleep in a cool, dark room, get the, the darkened shades, of course, uh, blackout shades, wear earplugs, or try a white noise machine to help. There's even more, there's different sheets that help with better airflow. I've even seen special bed fans that go in the, the mattress area itself, and, it's, and it's, it uh, directs the airflow underneath the sheets to help with you know overheating at night, of course, right? And then most importantly, keep the phone, the TV silent, try to mimic, mi try to reduce, I should say, your blue light exposure at night and creating a wind down routine, right? Meditation and stretching before bed, after you brush your teeth. So as you go to resume these habits, your body will start to know, okay, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm washing my face, I'm starting to start the process of falling asleep. And it's going to make it easier to fall asleep at night. The 8321 method is cool to note that we want to stop drinking caffeine eight hours before bed, aim to stop eating two, three hours before bed, stop drinking two hours before bed so that we're not waking up in the middle of the night to use the restroom as much aim to reduce blue light or stress one hour before bed. They even have the little blue light glasses. It's not the most evidence-based, but if it works, cool. If it doesn't, then they're just trendy. Um, I'm just kidding. And then aim to hit snooze zero times, right? 
get up when the alarm first goes goes off. Maybe set your phone and the charger across the room so you have to get up to turn it off. Physical activity. Tip one is we want to focus on reframing, reframing our definition of exercise. So in the past when I was a chunky lacrosse goalie, running was not my favorite thing on the planet. And then I, I didn't always associate exercise with being the most fun thing, right? Especially for those who may have done institutionalized sports, military, um, or para other paramilitary organizations like police and fire, where you had to kind of work out for your job, especially as like a college athlete, for example. And you're not always doing the exercises that you necessarily want to do. It's the exercises that your coach or your boss wants you to do. Um, so the association with exercise tends to be you know, uh, okay, this is a job, this is a task I have to do versus something I do just because it's fun, right? So something that I like to do on the weekends is just go paddleboard with some friends and it's really great exercise, but you don't even realize what you're doing, right? Or if you really like weightlifting or you really like walking and listening to a podcast, do what works for you and what makes you happy. Uh, do it with friends even. Practice mindful movement, of course, like being conscious of, you know, how you're feeling, how you're from a muscular standpoint, from your cardiovascular standpoint, but also mentally, right? Explore forms of movement that you enjoy. Like we said, peel back the layers and figure out your why. Why am I doing this movement? Am I do, trying to gain muscle? Am I trying to lose fat? Am I trying to just preserve muscle mass and, and longevity? What's my reason? and then maybe tailoring those workouts to those reasons. Don't work out to eat, eat to work out. So a lot of people will sometimes come into counseling and say, oh, I got to earn my calories. I got to, you know, do a 5k Thanksgiving morning so I can enjoy my Thanksgiving meal. Um, that can be somewhat disordered, to be honest. Um, on a low grade level, it's not crazy, but you really want to be saying, oh, well, I get to work out. I don't have to work out. And I'm excited to work out. And because I'm excited to work out, I want to fuel for that so I have an even better time. It's all about mindset. Uh, take rest days, please, for the love of God. Um, prevent injury. And then, of course, patience is a virtue uh, when it comes to not just exercise, but weight loss and uh, making healthy changes. Dietary strategies for managing menopause, like we were talking about earlier, we want to try to avoid trigger foods as well. Um, not the soy iso, not necessarily all soy, but like we were saying, the soy isolates, right? We want to avoid spicy foods, alcohol, caffeine, those can impact our detoxification processes, or the caffeine can actually really impact the hot flashes in our body's temperature. Uh, effects of a soy rich diet, like we were saying earlier. Those in like China or Japan or even Australian cultures have a 20% 20 20 reduced incidence of hot flashes where us in more westernized cultures that follow a standard American diet, limited, street slept, limited sleep and high stress, I just combined two words, uh, have an 85% incidence of hot flashes. So remember, like we were saying, supporting our adrenals, uh, complex carbohydrates for sleep, so we want to boost our serotonin levels. Serotonin is made in the gut from carbohydrates. So if you're trying to do a keto diet, um, it's going to be really hard to make progesterone. And it's also going to be hard to make serotonin, uh, which is our feel-good hormone. You want to try to maybe do like, an, like a low-fat low skim milk with some protein powders, like a protein shake, maybe with some fruit, some vegetables, maybe some chia seeds to help boost serotonin levels because you're getting the carbs from the fruit and the milk. Whole grain toast can also help to boost those serotonin levels, put it with some avocado, maybe some eggs, maybe some tomatoes. Sweet potato toast is another option too, or just cooking sweet potatoes with your meals. Next is some alternative therapies for menopause management. So something just to note, herbs and nutritional supplements really should be taken with caution and with the advisement of a registered dietitian or your provider, as they are unregulated by the FDA. Uh, they lack standardization. Uh, the quality and the standard herbal preparations, uh, including those over the counter and online, can, can vary 
a ridiculous amount if I'm buying one adaptogen versus another adaptogen. For example, adaptogens are substances that can help us to buffer stress and support our adrenals, and they can be good for people who are going through menopause. Adaptogens includes include supplements like ashwagandha, for example, rodelia rosacea, holy basil. They can be taken in uh, one large pill that has all of them in it. Uh, AG1 is another vitamin supplement that also has adaptogens in it as well as some vitamin D and, and other uh, supplements as well. The uh, best way to use herbal supplements is, like I said, under the supervision of either a well-trained herbalist, naturopath, dietitian, or your provider, preferably. Uh, other common treatments that might be helpful is black cahoosh, evening primrose oil, dong kue, um, chase tree, or um, vitex is another term that can be under. Vitex is also good for women who are not undergoing menopause and might be having elevated progesterone or estrogen as well. Supplement morning signs. If it's highly promoted, like you're seeing like tons of commercials all over the place, balanced fruits and veggies, um, they are making really broad claims. The sourcing is questionable. The ingredients are lackluster. There's lots of testimonials that they're trying to use to promote their product. Um, again, speaking with a, 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 a provider or a clinician, to help evaluate, is this the right choice for me? Or hydroxycut, you used to see a ton of commercials for, for example, or like Golo, uh, you wanna evaluate that on an individual basis of if it's worthwhile for you to utilize, because some supplements are really great, but unfortunately, a lot of them are really not worth, worth the pennies, unfortunately. I love this quote by Walt Disney. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. So I know we went through a ton of stuff today. So maybe just pick two or three things you really want to focus in on, or maybe even just scheduling an appointment or listening to a new video on just healthy diet on our site, uh, whatever that is for you. It's just about how can I be a little bit healthier today than I was yesterday. Um, and overall, just loving ourselves a little bit more. Does anyone have any questions? Well, I do want to say thank you. This, of course, was being recorded. Uh, we will, of course, update the recording and we will be putting it up on our website. So if there's anything that you want to go back on or check in on uh, or just refer to, it will be available typically within one to two weeks on our Stony Brook WTC website under Member Services Nutrition Resources tab. Uh, thank you so much for listening today and have a wonderful rest of your day, guys.